Charles Darwin once asked, why is thought being a secretion of the brain more powerful than gravity, a property of matter? As if directly answering Charles Darwin's thought, J.B.S. Haldane said, the world shall perish not for the lack of wonders, but for the lack of wonder. Since the very inception of the human race, people have been wondering about what makes us humans, what makes us behave like humans. It is the observation of the normal behavior and the varied behavior that led philosophers to dwell on the existence of the mind and then eventually drawing a very thin line between the mind and the brain. All the wonder, of course, complemented by scientific advancements, led to the existence of the current field of neuroscience as we know of it today. And generally speaking of today, several artificial intelligence applications are being developed to try to reach the elusive goal of these applications functioning exactly like the human brain does. Therefore, stemming from the steeply growing importance of neuroscience happened the conception of NeuroUnoia 2020, the main event of which would be on October 16th and 17th. All of us have such a wonderful organ, our brain, which can make us believe in miracles, help us change our perception of what a miracle is, and can actually make us see miracles happening all around us with the aim of shedding some light on the miraculous aspects of our brain. I, Dr. Udita Mukherjee, welcome you all to the pre-conference super preview of NeuroUnoia 2020. Here we are, a month before the main event, hoping to share a preview of what we are going to hear and learn in the main event in October. It is indeed very humbling to have such an esteemed gathering with us. We are very humbled as well as delighted to have amongst us our esteemed chairman, Professor Rihan Khan Suri. He is agreeing to join us on the pre-conference super preview infuses us with effervescent optimism. Professor Suri is also currently heading the Central Placement Cell in Jamia Millia Islamia Central University as the training and the placement officer. I would request Professor Rehan Khan Suri to kindly address the gathering. Thank you very much, Dr. Mudita, for giving me this opportunity to be in this gathering, uh, Dr. Sanjay Pratap Singh, Chairman and Professor of Department of Neurology, Creighton University School of Medicine, Omaha, U.S. Remote School, uh, Dr. Pramila Kumar, Principal Garvi College, uh, STCB members, faculty members, and participants, ladies and gentlemen, a good, very good evening to all of you. First of all, I congratulate the organizing team of uh, this conference, international conference, basically call it e-conference on Neuroionia 2020 in neuroscience affair. As we all know, during this pandemic, the cases of mental health have been rising every day. And the importance of this, this topic is so big. And the topic has been chosen by the Gargi College this time for the conference. It is really commendable. The human brain is wondrous again, organ, and we use it every moment of our lives, and yet so much about it remains a mystery. How do our minds make choices? Why is it so easy to remember the lyrics? To our favorite childhood song, but we forget important passwords. Do we really use only 10% of our brains? It would be fascinating to know about wonders of neuroscience and the significant breakthrough, breakthroughs that we can hope to see in the next few years. I welcome Dr. Sanjay Pratap Singh. I welcome other esteemed members. I congratulate my entire faculty members, 
theme of this organizing theme of this international conference and i hope this conference would be a another milestone of the research work in this area and we are so happy and glad to welcome dr sanjay singh and we would really will be glad to hear from him on this subject i again congratulate dargi college and tag college the, the faculty students and the other staff members on this pre conference preview and i wish all the very best for the success of this international conference thank you very much thank you so much sir for your kind words and words of encouragement we indeed need that needless to say but very very important to mention that this conference would not have been possible without the steadfast support of our principal dr pramila kumar who is also the patron of neuro you know ya 2020 we are indeed very grateful dr kumar for her unconditional support and guidance i would request dr kumar to kindly take over the mic and address the gathering good evening everyone i extend a very warm welcome to dr sanjay pratap singh speaker for today professor rehan khan suri the chairperson of gargi college distinguished guests and participants to the pre conference super preview of neuro unaya 2020 i am glad that gargi college is hosting a first virtual conference of its kind on neuroscience gargi college was established in 1967 with a noble cause to promote higher education amongst young women who wanted to enter professional arena and participate as equals in a nation building project the college was named after an enlightened woman uh, enlightened woman scholar gargi who figured in britannia upanishad and was renowned for her fearless inquiry and relentless search for answers right at the beginning it's crucial to understand the importance of this conference in today's day and age where like every other thing neither neuroscience is a stand alone subject nor are its repercussions it is rather important for us to consciously realize the importance of our brains as i say this sentence i am aware that i am using the term conscious which is technically under the purview of psychology ironically it is indeed the very essence of the subject neuroscience which majorly aims to scale the gap between the mind and the brain and what a mundane but wonderful thing it is that all of us irrespective of our specializations and interests have both the mind and the brain with the aim of shedding some light on the wonderful miracles of the brain we have dr sanjay pratap singh as the speaker with us today dr singh is the chair chairman and professor of the department of neurology at creighton university school of medicine Omaha, USA. He is the director of Neurological Institute at CHI Health in the same school. He is also the president of the Association of Indian Neurologists in America and a fellow of the American Academy of Neurology and American Neurological Institute Association. Dr. Singh received his medical degree from MLN Medical College in India. where he was first in order of merit he completed a neurology residency at george washington university medical center at washington dc where he was awarded the best resident prize he then did a two year fellowship in epilepsy and clinical neurophysiology as the gilbert glaser fellow at yale university school of medicine He has written a book on neurology and also several book chapters in other medical texts. 
He has authored several scientific research articles in prestigious medical journals. He is the recipient of several awards like the A.B. Baker, A. B. Baker Teacher Recognition Award by the American Academy of Neurology, the UNMC Chancellor's Gold U Award, and Kudos Award of the Board of Regents of University of Nebraska. Lifetime Achievement Award at the Indo-Global Healthcare Summit, Hyderabad. And numerous other awards for his professional and teaching excellence. He has been invited to lecture at many national and international institutions and conferences. He has also given talks to the community in TEDx science cafes and Simply Science programs. He has also been featured as an expert in many TV programs in the USA. I hand the screen over to Dr. Singh without further ado. Thank you so much, uh, all of you. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Kumar, Dr. Suri. I particularly want to thank uh, Dr. Jaswinder Kaur, who's uh, been coordinating this as the convener of this conference. Um, and I also want to thank Dr. Mukherjee and all the co-conveners uh, who have worked on this. So without further ado, we will get uh, to my charge, which is to give you a talk, take you on a journey, uh, essentially, of um, I'll give you a whirlwind tour of the new findings uh, as it relates to the brain, now, obviously an organ that we are all um, in love with. So let me start with that. So it is a somewhat complex organ, the brain. And the reason for that is um, that it has 100 billion brain cells. And potentially each of these brain cells can have up to 10,000 connections or synapses, as we call them. So uh, you could have a hundred trillion brain states, uh, and that is immense. Even if you look at it from an as from an astrological perspective, because uh, it's almost more than the number of uh, galaxies in the universe, uh, in the known universe as we know it. Now, my approach, since I uh, am essentially a clinician. Um, uh, is going to be patient-based. So I'm going to use patient stories to uh, to share with you uh, unique findings of the brain. So bear with me on that. Um, we have an ambitious agenda today uh, that I discussed with Dr. Kaur. Uh, we are going to talk about neural enhancement or manufacturing geniuses, things that uh, I think everyone needs to know. Um, and then genetics and the brain and then consciousness. And um, if time permits, we'll talk about memory too. So neural enhancement. So this is what um, we sometimes refer to brain 2.0. Um, and you'll see how fascinating the journey has been towards this. All right. So uh, I'm going to start out uh, by uh, telling you about a patient with a certain type of dementia. And since we have a varied audience, uh, let me just um, briefly touch on dementia. Dementia is a neurological disorder uh, in which you have problems with memory and you also will have problems with other parts of cognitive functioning. So, but memory and it's particularly a disorder of the uh, elderly. Uh, so that's one type of dementia is called frontotemporal dementia. Uh, essentially, the, the front part of your brain uh, starts to degenerate in this type of dementia. And dementia, as you would realize, as we've just discussed, is a disorder of memory. So people are not able to uh, really remember things or balance their checkbooks and those kinds of things you need for independent living. So uh, let me talk about the first patient story. So this was a patient in Los Angeles, um, a high functioning business executive who um, was uh, doing quite well. And then over time, he developed this frontotemporal dementia. And in the United States, when they develop, uh, you know, this kind of severe brain disorders uh, where they are not capable of independent living, uh, then they stay, they stay in nursing homes. Uh, where they can be taken care of. So the family went around looking for a nice nursing facility where he could stay. 
The only problem was that every nursing facility that they were uh, that they went to uh, had an activity which was to draw and paint. Now um, that was a problem for them because uh, Grandpa Joe or the patient uh, was never good in art, so he could not draw a straight line if his life depended on it. Uh, and so they wanted to tell the nursing facilities that could you substitute this activity with something else. Uh, and the nursing facilities love this activity because you have a bunch of people who are doing one activity, which is to draw and paint, and you need only one or two people to monitor them. So it makes financial sense for nursing facilities to have this. So they said, sorry, this is the activity. Everyone has to do it, so will he. So when they could not find a nursing facility to place this gentleman, uh, they left him at, a play at one of the nursing facilities they liked and left. After about a month, they received a dreaded phone call from the director of the nursing home saying, uh, could you come tomorrow morning at 10 a.m.? So obviously they were there at 9 a.m. the next morning because they were very concerned about their family member. So once they get there and they talk to the family, uh, as soon as the director shows up, they say, is he OK? And he said, yeah, he is. And so they heaved a sigh of relief. And they and he said, no, I just wanted to talk to you about because you said he could not draw a paint. And they said, yeah, we told you he cannot draw and paint. Is he causing trouble uh, during the painting sessions? And he said, no, no, I just wanted to show you what he has done during those sessions. So he shared this painting. And obviously the family was um, really bewildered, right? They were shocked. And they said, are you sure this is what he painted? And the, and the director said, that is why I called you at 10 a.m. because this is their time to draw and paint. Let's go and see what he's working on. And so this is the next painting that he was working on, uh, which he then subsequently finished, right? So a shocked family. Obviously, they go back um, up north a little bit, San Francisco, where they see this uh, neurology specialist, and believe it or not, they are specialists who specialize in frontotemporal dementias. And so um, they go to the neurologist, they say, I think there's been some problem with your diagnosis because uh, the patient is becoming demented and turning into a painter. And the neurologist said, Oh, yes, I forgot to tell you, in some rare instances, these patients do develop uh, these enhanced uh, skills in painting and drawing. And the family thought, well, it would have been nice to know this before. But anyway, uh, the next question is what at least 15 years ago, every neurologist dreaded, which was, why does this happen? And the neurologist at that time uh, had to tell them, I have no clue why this happens but it does happen. Now, the Japanese did this study, and there's nothing on this slide to really explain it, but uh, did a study uh, that only the Japanese can do. So why do I say that? They get these um, high-tech equipments before um, most countries. Uh, and so they, they had this equipment that they call a transcranial magnetic stimulator. Essentially, it's a wand by which you can stimulate or inhibit any region of the brain, right? So you keep it outside the skull and you can uh, sh hit the brain with these magnet magnetic waves and you can stimulate or inhibit any region of the brain. So they devised an experiment where they said, we will stop the functioning of the right side of your motor region, which is on the side of your head. Um, and uh, we will uh, then ask you to do a right hand task, motor task with your right hand. Now, everyone knows that the left side of your brain controls the right side of your body and the right side of your brain controls the left side of the body. So if you were to stop the functioning of the right side of the brain, the motor area, it should have no impact when you do any motor activity with your hand. Well, the Japanese said, we are in charge. We are going to do the study anyway. And so they inhibited the stop the functioning of the right motor cortex when someone was doing a right motor task, finger tapping task. And what they found was that the right finger tapping task improved measurably. That means it became better. The motor activity became better. And then they stopped the functioning of the left motor cortex and the left finger tapping task became better. 
So essentially, for the first time in human history, they showed that when one part of your brain stops functioning, our corresponding area of your brain starts to function better, right? Uh, obviously, in neuroscience, we are masters at giving very interesting names to such concepts, and so we called it paradoxical functional facilitation. Trust us to give really boring, long names to really fascinating concepts. Now, how does this explain our patient? So what is happening to the patient? The front of the brain is degenerating. The back of the brain is starting to function better. What is in the back of your brain? Your visual spatial perception, which is what you need to draw and paint. And that's why the unraveling of that area helps in that. Well, this is some understanding, but let's move forward. So a concept that I have been interested in for a very long period of time is studying savants. Uh, savants are essentially geniuses uh, in one particular area, whether it's music, art, math, and they're not so good in other areas uh, like social skills and other things, right? So let me show you this. This is on the right side of your screen. This is a horse that is drawn by a four-year-old. And I would say it's a pretty good four-year-old drawing, right? I always say some of my some of my neurology residents would not be able to draw horses like that. But look at the one on the left. This is the drawing of a horse by a three-year-old girl in Australia. Um, and how did this happen? Uh, young parents will realize that, you know, when you have something important to do, you give a child a piece of paper and a pencil and ask them to doodle on it, right? They just draw something, do something with it while you are doing something important. Well, when the parents came back, they found Nadia had drawn these pictures out of memory. A horse in motion out of memory, a drawing like this by a three-year-old, this is genius. This is savants, right? This gentleman, um, uh, some of you might recognize, was also a savant. Uh, his name was Kim Peek. Uh, and if you, some of you, uh, and I might be uh, age, you know, displaying my age at this point, but if you had seen the movie Rain Man of Dustin Hoffman, his character was based on Kim Peek. So what, who was Kim Peek? Kim Peek had read 9,000 books and he remembered every word of every line of every page of 9,000 books, right? Now, um, if you asked him, say, the word utopia, he would say it'd be, it was the third word on the sixth line of 171st page of this book and it was the sixth word of the fourth line in 204th uh, page of that book. That was his memory. Now, when you image his brain, when we image his brain, we find that the connections between the two hemispheres of the brain, the corpus callosum, what we call, uh, that connection is not strong. And the back of the brain, which is the balance center, the cerebellum, that's a little small, none of which explains his unique ability. Uh, and so we were actually trying to get him to study him, but then uh, he was taken by a much more important organization, NASA. Um, and uh, after that, he unfortunately passed on. You know, just to clarify, NASA had nothing to do with it, but, uh, you know, so we couldn't study his brain. We are now uh, finding other savants to study their brain. So the question was, why do these savants develop these special abilities? And in neuroscience, if you can come up with a theory that no one can disprove, well, that theory will appear in textbooks over time. So the theory was and uh, is that your brain, your brain develops with a clump of cells in the middle. And then those cells sort of migrate outwards, right? That's how your cortex, the most important part of your brain develops, right? Uh, and so the, con the theory was that when you have this migration of brain cells, well, more brain cells migrate to one region. And so you develop a special ability there and there are less brain cells everywhere else. And therefore you have not, you're not so good in the other parts of the brain. Very elegant theory. And this appeared in textbooks uh, right away. And we were moving along really well till we, this gentleman here came to life, Orlando. So what was the problem that we encountered with Orlando? Orlando was a kid in Baltimore um, in Maryland uh, on the East Coast of the United States. And, you know, they asked his ma mother, did he have any special abilities? Because if the child has any special abilities, the mother would know and the mother would talk about it. So the mother said, nah, Orlando didn't have any special abilities. He just liked to play ball. That's all that he really liked to do. 
So uh, yeah, that's uh, what she was told. Now, he was playing ball one day, um, and he got hit on the head by a baseball bat, which is somewhat different from a cricket bat, but, you know, it has a very powerful impact if you get hit with it. So he had a head injury. He was taken to what we in Yale used to call that little old hospital in Baltimore called Johns Hopkins, got treated at Hopkins, and then got discharged. Okay, then what happened? Well, in the last 20 years, since his accident, since his head injury, Orlando remembers every car plate number that he has ever seen in the last 20 years in sequence. He can also tell you what temperature it is on any day in the last 20 years since his accident. So what was the problem here? Orlando developed some genius-like ability after being hit on the head, right? He wasn't born with any special abilities. So our elegant theory of brain migration uh, didn't apply to Orlando. But as neuroscientists, we were not going to let one Orlando get rid of our elegant theory. We moved along, we just said, we have a very good word in, neuro in neurology and neuroscience for such happenings. We just call them odd. These were just odd things. But then this gentleman appeared just a few years ago, uh, a gentleman who was a construction worker. He dropped out of uh, primary school or elementary school as we call it here. Um, I did not know that you could drop out of primary school, but apparently he dropped out of primary school. Um, and he was a construction worker, had no interest in art or anything of that sort. Then one day he developed uh, uh, what was a really bad headache. So uh, that can mean sometimes when you have the worst headache of your life, that can mean that you had possibly a bleed in your brain, an aneurysm in your brain has burst. And that's what had happened with him. So he had a bleed in his brain. Now, most people don't live to tell you about it, but he did, right? Uh, he recovered from it. He then goes back to his neurologist and the neurologist checks him out and then asked a question that we train neurologists never to ask, which is, do you have any other problem? You know, that's an open-ended question uh, that you're asking. Well, this gentleman then told, tells his neurologist, you know, I have to tell you this, ever since I left the hospital, I have this irresistible urge to write poetry, paint, draw, and sculpt. Now I feel for that neurologist as this gentleman describes that neurologist was silent for a period of time. And then he said, oh, that, no, that's not what I asked. Are you weak on one side? Are you paralyzed? That's what I wanna know. And he said, no, so he goes on. So again, this is a second person who since then has been drawing, painting, sculpting, his, uh, Art has been displayed uh, at major venues around the world now. Uh, and he, he will tell you that the best thing that ever happened to him was the bleed in his brain. So now we cannot ignore the fact that we have two people with enhanced genius-like abilities that were not born with it, but developed it after suffering some injury to their brains. So why is this so fascinating? This is so fascinating because it is telling us that there are genius-like abilities that lie hidden in every human brain on this planet today. And we can possibly unravel those genius-like abilities in these individuals. So an experiment was done not so long ago and it has been confirmed where they inhibited a uh, part in the front of your temporal lobe, so in the, towards the front of your brain. They, with that same transcranial magnetic stimulator that you see here, they inhibited that region. And these, a significant number of individuals developed enhanced artistic abilities for a few hours, right? So we are entering a brand new era in human existence, where these genius-like abilities can be temporarily unleashed in every human brain uh, by which you can benefit. Now, it does throw up some um, ethical concerns, but the question is, when you're trying to study mathematics, you're practicing mathematics, right? And if some part of your brain can be zapped and you become better at mathematics for a period of time, 
uh, is that so wrong? So interesting debate that's happening at this point. But it is such a big thing about unraveling the genius within that the American Academy of Neurology had to come out with guidelines on neural enhancements, which is essentially manufacturing geniuses. So it has become such a reality, and it will be a reality within the coming decade or so, where extraordinary human abilities can be unleashed in most brains uh, of, of on this planet. It can also be done not just by the magnetic stimulator, but by uh, what, what we call direct current stimulation, transcranial direct current stimulation. So, you know, working memory, motor control, uh, visual perception. Now, as physicians, we look at this on how to treat disorders. And so we want to make the stroke patients uh, the, cure their paralysis or people with bad memory improve their memory. Uh, but obviously, they have other uses that can be done with this. All right. Well, this is kind of an interesting term, bionic man. It's somewhat um, misleading because the gentleman uh, that we are talking about is a gentleman who suffered neck injury. So he had a spinal cord was severed in his neck. It was cut in his neck. And so he was paralyzed from his neck down, could not move a single muscle in his uh, arms or legs and including his chest. So you can see that he's breathing through a tracheostomy. So he, he needs a machine to breathe for him, really. So the question was, how do we rehabilitate this individual? This was done in, in the New England area uh, here in the US. So what they, uh, what they thought about was that the, this individual uh, obviously will produce electrical currents in his brain, uh, but those electrical currents are not being communicated because the, for lack of a better word, the wiring has been cut up in the upper neck. So what did they do? They took a device, right? Uh, sort of this kind of device. This is not the actual size of the device. I wouldn't put this in anyone's brain. This is the actual size of the device. So they put this device in the motor region of the brain, right? And then they connected it uh, basically by a device and then a wire to a computer screen. And they asked the person to move his right hand, right? Because that will generate electrical activity in the left motor region of the brain. So when they asked him, can you move your right hand? He said, obviously, you know, I can't. They said, just try. So he tries to move his right hand. And what he does is he generates electrical activity here, right? And that is communicated by this device and interface and the wiring to a computer screen. And the cursor on the computer then starts to move in response to his mental activity. And in 24 hours of, of practicing this, he's able to open icons on that computer screen. There was also a thermostat on that computer screen, and he's able to raise the temperature of the room or decrease the temperature of the room all by his mental activity. Right? Now, obviously, engineers came to us, neuroscientists, and told us, I don't know if you realize, but many years ago, we developed something called the, called the remote. So you don't have to connect him with the wire. You can have some a remote device here and remote device, wireless device here, and he can move around in the room. Well, that was kind of revolutionary that he could move around. So essentially he could move around in the room and control things in the room just by his mental activity. Uh, and so that was fascinating uh, in the first, but there is also the bionic woman. So this is a woman who's been paralyzed uh, all over, but her mental functions are still okay. Uh, she has a disease called ALS. And so the same chips were implanted in her and she has a robotic arm attached to her wheelchair. And she controls the robotic arm with her mental activity. And she can pick things up, put things down, do things with her robotic arm, which is controlled by her brain's mental activity. So you can control your environment without moving a single muscle. What does this mean? This means in the near future, such patients could, if they tried to move their right leg, they could open the door. If they try to move their left leg, they could close the door. If they move their right hand, they could open the lights, switch on the lights. If they try and move their left hand, they can switch off the lights. So essentially controlling your environment without moving a single muscle uh, over here. Um, and I'm not gonna go into the details of the physics of this. It is fascinating, but I have put this in there in case people were interested in how this all happens. Um, now let's move on to brain and genetics. Right, uh, we cannot ignore genetics in today's world because it is so important. 
uh, and the brain is also um, influenced by it. So let's see the developments in a field called epigenetics. I'm sure most of you know this. The only people who don't know much about it are physicians. So um, I'm not going to spend too much time explaining to you what this is. Essentially, the way I like to explain this to my students and residents is uh, epigenetics is what controls which gene gets expressed and which gene does not get expressed. So which gene is on and which gene is switched off. So by epigenetics, you can switch on and switch off genes. Now, why is that fascinating? It is fascinating because you could inherit a bad gene, but if I can switch it off, as if you don't have it, right? I, if you have a good gene, but it's not switched on, then there's no point in having it, right? So what I generally tell my students is epigenetics is like the software. Your DNA is your hardware. Epigenetics is your software. So it has the ability to switch on and switch off genes, right? And so that is a fascinating new tool that we have in our armory now, uh, especially in understanding the brain and also in treating diseases. Let me just talk about this one experiment that was done at Duke. Um, so there is a variety of mouse, mice called agouti mouse. So these are obese mice. You can see they have high blood pressure, diabetes, they're unhealthy, they die quickly, right? And it's because of an agouti gene. That's why this happens. So uh, in the agouti gene, so what they took was they took pregnant mice who, were, who had the agouti gene, uh, and they took these pregnant moms, uh, and they fed them green leafy vegetables. Now, what are these green leafy vegetables? One way by which epigenetics works is by methylation. So methylation can switch on and switch off genes. The idea was to feed these pregnant mice, agouti, uh, which had agouti genes, this green leafy vegetables in the hope of switching off the agouti gene. And lo and behold, the ones that were compulsively fed the green leafy vegetables gave rise major in majority of cases to healthy mice without with the agouti gene inherited, but switched off as opposed to those that were not fed these and they had the babies with uh, obesity uh, and diabetes and, and hypertension. So why is this so fascinating? This is so fascinating because what you had for, for lunch today has the potential of altering the expression of your genes. This does not just happen in you, it is inherit, inherited that we know of by experiments for at least five to six generations. Right? So essentially what we eat has the potential of influencing at least the next five to six generations, right? With a thing that we were totally unaware of. The next uh, study, the only second study and the only other study I'll talk about with epigenetics was this study out of Canada. They looked at uh, suicide victims and they divided that group suicide victims into two, ones that had child abuse and ones that did not have child abuse. And they looked at the epigenetic profiles and the epigenetic profiles of those who had suffered child abuse was very similar to the epigenetic profile of animals that were separated from their mother at birth. So some kind of child abuse, right? So why is this so fascinating? This is so fascinating because we now uh, have some understanding how the stress that you undergo, the behaviors that you display have the potential of determining which gene is on and which gene is off, right? So food, behavior, stress can all influence us and we've now found possibly the technique by which this happens. Obviously, we have not stopped here. We know that there are lots of neurological diseases that have epigenetic uh, uh, you know, points, basis for it. And uh, those disorders are now being, uh, there's research started to treat those disorders by modifying uh, epigenetics. So that's how that's being looked at. And uh, the other thing that you should know, and I'll just briefly touch on this, is this technology called CRISPR. And mind my words, uh, within the next two years, there will be a Nobel Prize uh, for given for CRISPR. CRISPR is a, is a very effective gene editing technology. So essentially, you can target any gene and you can switch it. 
And so there are brain disorders like Huntington's disease, uh, which is a single gene abnormality that is now, uh, at least in research, uh, and the trials have started that where we could just switch that one gene by CRISPR and cure the patients, right? So a huge, huge development. How is it going to influence medicine other than what I just told you? So one of the things that has started is that a lot of human disorders happen because of mutations or changes in genetics, right? Now, those inherited diseases, uh, what is happening now is you can do a whole genome analysis of a person uh, for like $400, what used to cost a lot more in the past. So you do a whole genome analysis of a, of a person, you find out the mutation that's causing the problem, you take that same mutation and by CRISPR induce it in an animal, and then treat that animal with a bunch of medications that you think may be effective. In this case, there were 1,200. And then the medications that work best are sent back to your physician so he knows exactly how to treat the patient, right? This is called personalized medicine uh, in, in a huge way. And this is happening uh, as we speak. It's already started in epilepsy. Okay, now I'm going to touch upon consciousness as a subject. So consciousness, you know, as uh, um, people have said, used to be in the realm of philosophy right, or even then psychology, but now it is in the realm of neuroscience because we've understood it a little bit better. So uh, there are tons of de definitions of consciousness, but as, uh, as, as neurologists and neuroscientists, the definition we use is consciousness is a state of being awake and aware of one's self and surroundings. That's what we use uh, as a clinical definition of this, right? It, you know, the person's aware and he's experiencing himself and his environment. States of consciousness. So uh, neuroscience, we say there's the awake state, the sleep state, and the dream state, right? So essentially, more technically, there's the awake state, there is the non-REM sleep, and then the REM sleep. REM sleep is when you're dreaming, right? Uh, it's obviously, uh, I use this slide all the time, that uh, thousands of years ago, uh, the Mandukya Upanishad said the same thing. It says Jagrat which is the wakeful, swapna, which means the dream, sushupti, which means dreamless sleep. And it was amazing that they would have that concept in those times. And then they, of course, talk about the turiya, the fourth state of consciousness, which uh, we would all like to study, but uh, it's not part of the lexicon of modern neuroscience yet. So, you know, we obviously describe loss of consciousness as coma. There are various degrees of coma uh, that come through. Um, but the most important thing is how how do how are we conscious? What is the basis of our consciousness? So now uh, you know one of my colleagues at Yale did this study in animal models, and now it's been looked at even in humans, uh, where the thalamus, which is in the depth of your brain, is connected to your cortex by these uh, brain cells or neurons, right? And if the oscillation, the electrical oscillation in these circuits is eight hertz or ten hertz. That means eight cycles per second or 10 cycles per second, then the person is conscious. If this cycling is three hertz, that means three cycles per second or two cycles per second, the person is unconscious. So we have learned this. This is a very fundamental discovery that this is the essential human circuit for consciousness. Everything else can influence this. So your ascending reticular activating system, everything else just influences this basic circuit. So what is the utility of this knowledge of the basic human circuit of consciousness? So what is the disorder of consciousness in clinical worlds? Coma, right? So based on this knowledge, a 38-year-old gentleman who was in coma uh, was taken and his brain was implanted with electrodes. So they put in electrodes right here into the depths of his brain, right? And they switch the frequency high so that the there would be increased frequency of the oscillations of the brain, right? And what they found was that this comatose individual woke up and was able to name objects, started to eat with his own hands, and he could swallow food, right? This one who was completely comatose on a bed was now doing all of this. So our knowledge of the essential circuit of human consciousness has now allowed us to actually wake people up from coma. This is still not in clinical use, 
So I don't want you to go to your ICUs and ask them to uh, wake people up, but it will be very, very soon. Imagine if we could wake people up who are in coma, uh, some of them for years, uh, even for a few minutes to a few days to a few weeks, a few months. Uh, that would have immense uh, uh, benefit for the families. So uh, I'm going to talk about this. Now, this image that I'm showing you is what we call a functional MRI. And this is really one of the keys of discovering new things about the brain. So what's a functional MRI? If you are happy, the functional MRI looks at where uh, that happiness comes from in your brain, right? So essentially, it's based on blood flow. Uh, so it can mark out the active regions of your brain. So functional MRI can mark out the active regions of your brain. And that's important uh, you know, for people to know. So this patient who was comatose for more than 10 years, right? Uh, they took him into a, into a functional MRI. And before they did that, they took controls, which are normal people, not in a coma. And they asked these normal people to imagine they were playing tennis while they are in the functional MRI. When normal people imagine playing tennis, this is the region of the brain that got activated, the SMA region, right? Then they ask these normal people, imagine you're walking around in your home, right? And so the, these regions got activated um, when they were imagining themselves walking around in a home. Then in Canada, they took this patient who was comatose, as I said, for more than 10 years, right? Uh, they then looked at, uh, asked him, so this is an absolute comatose patient who's put in a functional MRI, supposed to be in a vegetative state. Uh, and they asked the patient, imagine that you're playing tennis and this region of the brain whoa, lit up, right? Very similar to this region. Then they said, stop imagining that you're playing tennis and this region became silent. Then they said, imagine you're playing tennis, this region became active again. Then they told the same person, imagine you are walking around in your home, right? This is an comatose individual and these regions became active, very similar to these regions, right? Then they said, stop imagining, this all went away. Then the activations came back when they asked, asked him to imagine walking around in the house. So a, a comatose individual who's been in a coma, we say for over 10 years, brain damage as you can see over here, right? Right here. They are not unconscious. He is responding to commands. He's just not able to verbalize it or move his arms and legs because of this. And then they said his name was Scott. They said, Scott, is your name Scott or is your name David? And then they told him, if we, we say it's yes, we'll understand it's yes if you imagine playing tennis. And we'll, we'll take it as a no if you imagine walking around in your home. And they asked him, are you, are you Scott? This lit up. Are you David? This lit up. Are you in a hospital? This lit up. Are, are you walking around in a mall? This lit up, right? So he's answering questions. Uh, individuals that we have pronounced to be in a coma for over 10 years, right? So this is another fascinating aspect that we have to come to know. All right, let's see. I'm going to go, let's go to memory, right? Uh, memory, most people know. So uh, for the younger members in the audience, I want to tell them uh, in a nutshell where memory stays in your brain. So for the, if someone tells you a phone number to dial, right? You have to remember the phone number to dial. Uh, for the seconds to a minute or so, it stays, the memory stays in your frontal region frontal lobe. Minutes to about 10 years, this memory then gets transported to your hippocampus, right? And that's where it stays for 10 years. And then after 10 years or so, the memories then go to your association cortices. What, what is that? So there is association cortex for, vis for vision, which is where the visual memories will go. Association cortex for hearing, which is near the hearing cortex, that's where your hearing memories, sound memories will go. So that's how this is. So in a nutshell, this is how memories stay. But obviously, we got here by the work of a lot of good people. So 
Hippocampus really is the mainstay of your memory. How did we discover that? We discovered that by accident. This person here is a patient called HM. Some of you might have heard of him. So HM uh, it was a person in Connecticut and he had epilepsy. And epilepsy um, essentially caused him to have seizures. And his neurologist was figuring out where are these seizures coming from so we can cut that region out, right? So uh, essentially what happened here was that uh, he wasn't sure whether it was the right hippocampus or the left hippocampus that these uh, seizures were coming from. Well, his neurosurgeon, who's, uh, who, who are usually more sure of themselves, said, now what's the big deal? I'll just cut both of them out. And he did perfect surgery. As you can see here, he took out both his hippocampus right here. The holes are the hippocampus taken out. And he woke up as a surgical success, right? Um, he had uh, no seizures, but there was a minor problem. He had no memory either, and he could not form any new memory. So this was a problem uh, as, as, as this was going on. So he contacted his mentor, Wilder Penfield, uh, who's a neurosurgeon who trained him. And Wilder Penfield sent down his neuropsychologist, Brenda Milner. And so Brenda Milner goes down from Montreal uh, and then meets with HM every month for the next 10 years. And that is how we've discovered the vital role that the hippocampus plays. We've also, we've also realized that there are different kinds of memory. So Brenda Milner actually taught HM uh, various kinds of, of tasks. One was to draw a star while looking into a mirror. So he can't see what he's drawing, but he can see it in a mirror. And so he does that. Now with practice, HM gets better at this, right? He does not remember Brenda Milner. Every time Brenda Milner sees him, she's been seeing him for 10 years. Every time she sees him, she has to reintroduce herself. So that memory is not there, but he continues to get better and better at this. So what he practices, he gets better at. So we then learned that there, there are different kinds of memory. So what do we mean by that different kinds of memories? One memory is episodic memory. Episodic memory essentially is, what did you do last night? What did you have for dinner two days ago? That's episodic memory. Semantic memory is memory, it's essentially knowledge. So what is the capital of France? What is the capital of Germany? That is semantic memory, that's knowledge. That stays in a different region of your brain. And then there is these procedural memories like the drawing of the, of the star. And so the question is, where do they stay? So the episodic memory, Episodes of your life. What did you have for dinner last night? Who did you meet two days ago? That stays in your hippocampus, right? Then what about knowledge, semantic memory, right? That stays in the outer part of your temporal lobe. So that is knowledge. What about working memory, like your skills of how to drive or how to draw a star by looking into a mirror? That stays in your cerebellum uh, and then your basal ganglia regions, right? So now we've We've learned because of Brenda Milner that their memory is of different types and it stays in different parts of the brain. And so damage to one particular part of the brain only damages one particular type of memory. As I go forward, I see that people are raising questions. I'm, what I've told the organizers is right at the end of my talk, I will stay for as long as needed and answer each of those questions. So uh, if you want to put them in the chat, I'm sure the organizers will uh, provide me with the questions and I will answer them. Okay, the other, uh, we cannot talk about memory, not talk about the Nobel Prize winning effort of Eric Kendall. So Eric Kendall really at a molecular level, at a cellular level discovered memory. So what did he find? Instead of studying the human brain, he, he was intelligent. He said, this is a hundred billion brain cells. I'm gonna study the sea snail, the aplysia brain for this. So what did he find in that? He found that this is the sea snail, right? He said, if I touch, the sea snail's gill, right, or the siphon. If I touch that siphon, right, and I associate it with an electric shock, a tail shock, electric shock. So when I touch, I, I give a tail shock, right? So essentially, it has associated these two things, right? So if you associate this once, and then when you just touch the siphon without any shock, the animal will respond as if it'll coil up as if it was expecting the tail shock. And this will last, this memory will last for a few minutes and then it will disappear. So if an hour later you touch it, it won't 
display that enhanced reflex. However, if you associate this touching and tail shock five times or more, then it will remember this association for days. So what has happened? Short-term memory has formed when you associate it once and long-term memory has formed, real memory has formed after you've associated it five or more times. So what is happening? Essentially what is happening is that the connections between two brain cells is called a synapse. This is the secret of memory, the connection between two brain cells. Now, when you associate it once, short-term memory means the synapse, the connection between brain cells becomes stronger, right? The existing connection becomes stronger. So you have existing connection and that has become stronger, right? But long-term memory, once you associate the electric shock and the siphon touching five or more times, what happens is there is a genetic change that happens and that leads to the growth of a new synapse. So what it does is it leads to growth of new synapse and that is long-term memory. So short-term memory is essentially the synapse becoming more attached to one another, right? And long-term memory is another synapse being formed. So this was phenomenal work uh, done by Rick Kendall, and there's a lot of therapeutics on how to enhance memory and how to decrease memory based on his work. Now, what about manipulating memories? That is an important concept that we must uh, look at, right? And memory, the formation of memory is the formation of our sense of self, right? So if we can alter memory, that is a very fundamental thing. So this is a basic experiment. Essentially, what you do is you take, uh, you know, some kind of uh, chamber and you fill it with, uh, with water or liquid and you have a submerged platform and you leave a mouse in it. So the mouse swims around, swims around, finds the submerged platform and stands on, it, right? The next time you leave the mouse in the same submerged platform, it goes around and it takes less time to find the submerged platform. Slowly, it gets better and better at this. So memory is forming over time. However, if you leave the mouse in this water and it takes its time and finally finds the submerged platform, first try, right? You take the mouse out and you inject adrenaline. If you inject adrenaline in, in the mouse, it's as, and then you leave the mouse, the next, the second time when you leave the mouse, the mouse goes directly to the submerged platform, right? So the adrenaline we found has the ability to burn memories into the brains, right? And so when does this happen in human beings? When is your adrenaline really flowing? We've realized that it's really, obviously really flowing when you're in a war-like situation. So when our army uh, people are fighting wars, when bullets are flying and people are dying, your adrenaline is rushing. So what is that adrenaline doing? It is burning those traumatic memories into the brains of these people. And therefore, a lot of soldiers, when they come back from wars, they develop what we call PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. Essentially, they have flashbacks to those traumatic memories and they can't get rid of them. Why can't they get rid of them? Because adrenaline has burnt it into their brains. So, um, in the US, the study was done where people who had suffered a traumatic event, right? Something really, really bad, accident, you know, other things, assault. Um, and they were divided into two groups. One group was given propranolol, a beta blocker, essentially a blocker of adrenaline. So they were given a blocker of adrenaline and the other group was just given sugar pills, placebo, right? And they found that this blocker of adrenaline, if given early, right? And for a period of time, it actually prevents this PTSD disorder from developing in a substantial number of these patients, as opposed to the other one. So essentially what they're doing is they're preventing those memories from being burnt into the brains, right? The second concept I wanted to share with you, this is a revolutionary concept in memory these days. Uh, Kareem Nader uh, at McGill uh, had developed this concept. What was his concept? His concept was that we, from the work of Eric Kendall and others, we have learned that how memory is formed. So when you experience something, a memory is formed, right? What he found was when you remember it or recollect that thing, it is as if you have brought the memory forth. So the way I like to explain it is, suppose you experience something and it becomes a memory. What has happened? You've probably taken a file and put it into a cabinet, right? And when you remember it, you actually take the file out of the cabinet. 
and then after you remember it, this memory which has been taken out has to be reconsolidated back into that cavity, right? So what does this discovery tell us? This discovery tell us that we can modulate memories that have formed in the past by recollecting them and then interfering at this point and not letting them being formed again, right? So essentially you have new memory stored, right? Stored memory becomes memory. Then you remember it. So it comes out and before it can be reconsolidated, you can modify it, right? So we don't have to be giving medications right at the time of formation of memory. Memories of the past can be recollected and can be changed. So essentially a uh, study was done with PTSD again uh, with the military. And what they looked at was that they were made to recall their traumatic events. So the memory has come out. And then they were given these beta blockers, adrenaline blocking drugs of drugs that can affect the memory, right? So they recollect. So the file has come out of the cabinet and they prevent that file from going back into the cabinet and therefore they decrease the traumatic memories, right? So that was one thing. Even more fascinating was a lot of you may have, uh, at least the, yourself or someone you know, who are really afraid of heights or really afraid of um, what we call arachnoids or insects, right? Or spiders. Um, so uh, if that is if that is the case, um, a scientist in Belgium did this study very recently, where what they did was they took people who were arachnophobes. Essentially, they hate spiders, and tarantula is a type of uh, spider. So uh, they hated spiders. Right. So she brought them into a room where the spider was. Right. So she brings them into a room where the spider is. Uh, they hate that, they absolutely hate it, but that memory has now come out. And she gives them 80 milligrams of propanolol, so one shot of a beta blocker, preventing that memory from being reconsolidated, right? And she found that these people who were brought forcefully into this room with the big spider that they hate, that memory came out when this drug, which blocks adrenaline was given to them in about, and this is fascinating that just in a few days, they were fine with coming into that room now, right? And in about three months, they could hold the spider in the palm of their hand. These are people who hated this, right? So again, the idea is that we are able to play with memory in a form that we have never been able to do in the past. And more recent, just in a parallel track, what's happening is at a cellular level, uh, we have this technology called optogenetics. So we can program cells to respond to light, right? Um, and so um, at Columbia, one of the researchers is able to tag individual memories in your hippocampus. So what, what do I mean by that? So they took a mouse and they put the mouse in a friendly environment, which for a mouse is dark and soft platform. Right. So the mouse is there, gets in that environment. He feels safe. He walks all around. Right. That's how what the mice do. Uh, that memory of that environment is tagged in his brain. Right. By this optogenetic technology. Right. So we have tagged an individual memory in the brain of this mouse. Now we take the mouse and we put the mouse uh, in a uh, in an environment he does not like, which is these rollers, right? As you can see right here and well lit, very well lit, right? So uh, the mouse stays uh, in a corner and doesn't walk around. Now with this technology, we have, we can insert light into the mouse's brain by these fiber optic technology. When we switch the light on, the memory that we had tagged, the memory of the favorable environment where it was dark and it was soft base it, that lights up in the mouse's brain and so the, even though the mouse is on these rollers in a well lit because that memory has been switched on the mouse starts to move as if it is in a friendly environment right so now you can not only tag an individual memory you can activate it at will and make the animal behave uh, mm -hmm. the way you would want it so that's something that's actually happening this study essentially also told us that the problem in Alzheimer's is not that uh, there is a problem with forming memory. It's actually retrieval of memory, which is a problem in Alzheimer's dementias. 
And uh, now you can also associate fear and memory and you can then activate them in, in these individuals. And then finally, you can actually record these memories uh, and then play them back. Uh, play them back. So essentially what's happening is that you are connecting uh, the memory cells with an electronic device where you're downloading it onto a computer. And then you can reactivate that uh, memory into the brain of, of that animal uh, by that computer technology. So uh, that's what you're doing in these individuals. So inserting, you can actually insert memories through this technology and you can record memories through this technology. Again, this is very, very recent, just in the last few months uh, that this is coming through where developing a hippocampal neuroprosthetic uh, to facilitate memory encoding and recall. So uh, that kind of stuff is also happening. Um, I'm going to stop here, Dr. Kaur. I think uh, that was the time given to me, so I'm not going to go any further. Um, I want to thank uh, everyone for listening, and I want to thank Dr. Kaur uh, for this, and I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, you might have for me. Thank you, sir. Extremely intriguing lecture, sir. Uh, I can see our participants are curious to get their questions answered. <laughs> I will begin uh, the questions one by one. So we have sure. the first question by uh, Yashika, Miss Yashika. Uh, sir, can you please tell us more, more about the CRISPR technique? So that's our first okay. question. So the CRISPR technique uh, is essentially a technique by which uh, what happens is, you know, we have DNA, which is our genes. What they do is they match, and the DNA has these code, right? Adenine, guanine, cytosine, you know, all of that. So that A, C, D, T, that kind of uh, the, the base pairs, they are replicated. So you can make a corresponding base pair and attach it to, this tech, uh, to a device that can cut the gene. So essentially what happens is it goes like a guided missile, attaches to the part of the DNA, cuts it out, right? And uh, a further advances, it can cut it out and insert another one in there, right? And so this kind of technology is allowing gene editing in a way that has never been possible in human history. Uh, and so obviously we can we are planning to use it for uh, curing diseases in a way we have never been able to do. Uh, they're also using it in other things to increase uh, you know agricultural produce, uh, to make uh, crops resistant to any kind of, uh, of insects. Uh, one of the uh, one of the interesting things is that they are using it. Uh, they are planning to use it in Africa by using CRISPR. They can edit a mosquito's gene uh, and then eliminate uh, malaria causing mosquitoes in a certain region of Africa. Now, all, all of this is, is fascinating. And the, this is the speed at which science is advancing. Uh, that is why it's essential for people who are not in hardcore uh, science to also know this, because I think society at large needs to know this will change the way we live uh, in times to come in such a profound way that we have never been able to do before. Next question. The next question is from Subhashri. Uh, so your comments on Neuralink and neuro enhancements in future. So Neuralink, you know, uh, is kind of an interesting uh, concept that, you know, Ram Moss has got. Um, the problem with that is that it is a very infant kind of stage. So the prosthetic and the, uh, the technology that they are trying to use is similar to what I have described is based on those experiments that I've described. Um, because being a commercial entity, you know, they have not really come out with a lot of stuff. I think what this launch was of uh, Elon Musk was essentially uh, to invite more neuroscientists um, and uh, neurologists to come and join his effort to do this. I think they're not anywhere close to um, doing um, neural enhancements in a way that we've just talked about, uh, but it's a very interesting technology. I congratulate Elon Musk for, for investing in it uh, in a major way. And I hope something good comes out for all people because the first thing to do is to make people who are paralyzed to have them uh, be able to walk and, and people with neurological deficits to, to do that. Uh, but I think as they themselves have admitted, they're nowhere close to it at this point in time. Next question. Question is from Janvi. 
and uh, she's saying that is there any ongoing or upcoming research which links diseases like cancer to epigenetics? Yes. So, you know, obviously, you know, in, in about 50 minutes, I couldn't go over everything. There are actually three drugs right as we speak for cancer and epigenetics. So essentially what happens is in certain types of cancer, you inherit a, inherit a cancer gene. And if we can just switch that gene off, it's as if you, you know, that's one of the ways to cure cancer, right? So that kind, there are three drugs already being used for cancer treatments by basis of epigenetics. So in the past, we wanted to change your DNA and your genes, and we had gene therapy, and that really did not work. But now epigenetics has given us a whole new way of playing with the genes because we don't have to change the gene. We can just switch on the good genes and switch off the bad genes and you'd be good. So uh, it is not only in cancer, but in all kinds of disorders, it's being studied uh, very actively at this point in time. Next question. So next question from Miss Amina. So, sir, as you said, a person makes neuro enhancement by an accident to the brain. So what is your comment on the loss of memory by such accidents? Can we bring the memory back by neuro enhancement? So it is being looked at because the memories haven't disappeared. The memories are still there. The basic problem in memory disorders is that we are not able to go and get the right memories. That is the problem. It's the retrieval of memory that's a problem. It's not the formation of memories. And the memories still exist in the brain. So a lot of work is being done to see the retrieval of the brain uh, memory should happen. Similarly, if you look at Eric Kendall's uh, studies, the cyclic AMP uh, is, is one thing that is very important in memory. And so there are new drugs being developed uh, to see if we can enhance that particular part. And, and so that we can uh, uh, you know, really strengthen memory, uh, both in terms of formation and in terms of uh, retrieval. Next question. The next is from Mr. Rahul. Sometimes we remember events happened in the past forever, whereas sometimes we forget about even the things which happened a few moments before. Why does this happen? And also sometimes we are good, very good with memory, but we are not good, not that good at mathematics. I remember more than 500 scientific names, but I'm poor in calculus. I literally don't understand calculus, but so what could be the neurological basis behind this? Yeah, good. Uh, so um, let me try and explain this a little bit. So, you know, memories, uh, first, let me explain the second part of your question about math and memory. Math is stays in a different part of the brain and memory stays in a different part of the brain. So uh, it's not necessary for someone who's good at memory to be good at math or good at math, be good at memory. So. Those are two different aspects altogether. And I always uh, joke that uh, most became physicians because we were not good at math. Had we been good at math, we would have done other things, um, like become scientists in those fields. The second is about memory. So, uh, you know, you don't remember everything because what we are learning is you prioritize. You want to remember something, right? And those are the memories that you probably form uh, in a, in a long-term manner. And the rest, you're just remembering them in a short term manner. Uh, obviously, we have not solved the riddle of memory completely yet. But in the last five to seven years, we, we have learned so much more about memory that we had never learned before. One thing we have learned is when you go to sleep, during sleep, your uh, brain connections or synapses that are essentially the fundamental memory, uh, what happens then is that your, during sleep, some of these synapses are pruned. They are destroyed and some of them become stronger during sleep. So during your sleep, you're actually fine tuning your memory. So you're taking away memory of things that you don't think are important and you are consolidating memory of things that you think are important. So during sleep, this is happening. Also during sleep, uh, you should know that during sleep, your brain is actually undergoing what we call a brain wash. So literally fluid going through your brain and washing off all the uh, bad stuff or all the toxins out of your brain. And so if you don't sleep enough, those toxins collect in your brain and you can develop diseases. So um, we have learned a little bit about memory and sleep and how that uh, all takes place. Uh, and that may have something to do with it. Next question. Uh, if a person with dementia has stopped responding, 
are there still chances of him developing the extra capabilities that you talked about if yes how can we identify and help the patient so uh, let's talk about it in general in the world at, at large there are hundreds of millions of people with brain damage have we looked for special abilities in them no because we didn't know it existed well now we do know and so we'll be looking so we might discover things in dementia what happens is it depends upon the stage of dementia because in in a lot of dementia the brain cells die off so if your brain cells are dead those abilities cannot come back memories cannot come back at that stage that's why catching dementia early on is important because if you catch dementia early on uh, then uh, you know hopefully within the next 6 months we should have some treatment which can actually make uh, the dementia go away wipe off the amyloid plaques which actually cause dementia so hopefully in the next 6 months we'll have that treatment with iv infusion to do that kind of therapy uh, uh, but in late stages of dementia the brain has been totally um, uh you know eaten away and so at that stage there's not much that can be done at this point in time unless we can make the brain cells grow again uh and do that that's a separate area of research next question uh is there any update of research to delete unwanted memories it could probably be useful to forget unpleasant memories yes yes that's So that's a big ethical question so we already have some ability as i told you with ptsd to uh, so if you've had say a bad session a bad day uh you know if the patient if the person comes to a physician and says i want that medicine and i want to wipe off the memory of this day because it's not there the question is are good and bad quote unquote good and quote unquote bad memories together make up the personality and the the individual that you are and if we were if have the ability to take off the bad memories and only keep the good memories we don't know what you would turn into so um is that capability around it's almost there uh, you know that capability but the question is should you should we do it and that's what we are grappling with uh, in the world of uh, of neurology right now next question Uh, so you talked about how neuro enhancement has been a newly researched field which will develop geniuses within most of us so if this happens what according to you are going to be the ethical obligations and standards that medical fraternity would have to follow owing to such neuro enhancements yes the ethical questions are 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 really really big and that's why Uh, I use such platforms uh, to share this information with the people at large because these decisions should not be made by a few individuals in 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 some uh, university hospitals in America or uh, or in some labs. This this needs to have input of the people at large. But the people at large don't even know that these things um, are are becoming possible. Um, So it is it's it's a big big ethical question. Now the question essentially is that the people with means might make use of these neural enhancements and get better at it. The fundamental basis of neural enhancement is has been discussed. Uh one of the concepts is that you know you practice uh something and you learn that thing. And if you if some if we can zap your brain and you learn it by reading it one time, um uh what's the difference there i mean it just shortens the amount of time for you to learn that that's just new technology the question is going to be uh how do you make that uh technology available to every single person um and uh, how do you take away the uh, disparities um in in the utilization of such technologies and this does not just end here because e- like artificial intelligence which uh, i think dr mukherjee was talking about um you know artificial intelligence uh, and i did not touch upon it because uh, we just did not have enough time for this artificial intelligence is just being approved for utilization in one uh, medical field which is in neurology and stroke medicine so in our cent- in our university we also have about 14 hospitals and we have an artificial intelligence system that is monitoring uh, ct scanners in all 14 hospitals as soon as the brain is imaged it will tell us that there this person has a big stroke and it will it will uh, sort of uh, tell us on our smartphones that this is what has happened and it transmits the images all under 6 minutes right so we can activate a helicopter to go and get that patient to us so that we can treat him uh, actively so this is really good use of artificial intelligence 
The other thing that is going to happen is that um, some of the US think tanks think that at least between 35 to 45% of the population will not have a job uh, uh, because of artificial intelligence, because the artificial intelligence will work in factories much better than human beings would. But the governments would have the money uh, that they have today. The, the revenue of the government will not go down. The question will be, how do you get that money to people who are doing nothing, right? So it's going in the coming dec one to three to four decades, uh, human existence will change in a profound manner. And I think the people need to become aware of this because this is going to profoundly affect the way we live, we govern ourselves in times to come. Next question, please. The next question is the brain performs different functions every day. Which hormones carry out this task and how? So the hormones have some effect. Uh, they, they don't, you know, it's uh, the brain controls the endocrine system. Brain has uh, uh, some degree of control over the endocrine system. Uh, the endocrine system does come back and influence the brain, but uh, the primary uh, influence is the other way around. And now uh, I do know that, uh, you know, uh, one of the things we are trying, one of my interests is in consciousness. And so we are in touch with some of the um, people who go into meditation and stuff, and they talk about the pineal gland. In modern medicine, uh, the melatonin that comes out of pineal gland, as far as we know, just affects uh, uh, the, uh, the, the sleep-wake cycle. It doesn't affect anything else. But yes, I, in my dialogue with some of the people, and I have not had, dialogue, had the chance to have dialogue with some of people in India, but um, you know, they tend to think that pineal plays some other kind of role, but not that we know of. But the only role that we know melatonin plays is in the sleep fake cycles. Next question, please. Yes. So next is why seizures in age group one to five years is quite common. So let me correct that. So the age group in which you have the highest incidence of seizures is over 60. So it's, it's in people over the age of 60, um, and as I'm getting old, I've stopped calling that age group elderly. So I just say people over the age of 60 have the highest incidence of new seizures. It's not in children. There is a higher incidence in children than in the young adults, but it is there. It's also because your brain is developing at this in, in this stage um, in a way that it does not develop in the young adults. So when you're born, you're born with many more synapses, many more connections of your brain, right? And then over time, those connections break off and you develop uh, the adult mature brain with much, men, with much fewer connections. So such active changes are happening in your brain and they uh, possibly lead to uh, these uh, disorders. Next. So next question is, uh, could you please tell from where does consciousness come? And what is the thing that observes our pure consciousness? Is it the consciousness that represents and remains constant in human? And sir, please do not mind. How do you answer it? If I ask you, what are you or who are you? There must be something constant that represents about yourself. So, yes, I mean, uh, it seems that the questioner is influenced by our great, uh, uh, you know, the Vedas and the Upanishads. Uh, in which these questions are asked, profound questions like these have been asked. And uh, so that is why I, I, I used, uh, I first uh, went over the definition of consciousness we use in, in neurology and neuroscience, uh, which is the person being awake and aware of himself and his uh, surroundings. Uh, this is a very good question, which we, uh, you know, in our research are trying to grapple with because uh, the question, um, as it is said in our, uh, in, in, in our, uh, ancient texts is uh, uh, drishti and drishta, right? Um, and, and so the, the, the field of energy and the energy itself. So um, do we, where do we see from? I can answer. We see from the occipital visual cortex. Who is seeing is a more profound question. Uh, that is something where uh, philosophy and neuroscience come together. Um, and we are actively grappling with it uh, at this point in time. Uh, we are also looking at uh, different parts uh, in, in, a, in a sort of from a neuroscience perspective. But that's, that's a question. In terms of our consciousness, uh, as defined by us, it is this thalamocortical circuitry. That is the final common pathway that I can. So in animals, what, um, you know, what my colleague at Yale did was 
you know, he took out this thalamocortical circuit, neuronal circuit, and he connected it to an electrical apparatus. And so he would switch the oscillating frequency to 8 hertz, the animal would be conscious. He would switch it to 3 hertz, the animal would fall unconscious. Switch it to 8 hertz, animal starts talk, you know, starts making sounds. Switch it to 3 hertz, animal is lying asleep. So uh, that we have found the formal common pathway of human consciousness as we describe it. The consciousness that is as is described in the Upanishads is, is much more profound. And so we have a long way to go to try and determine um, the drishti and drishta uh, dualism that is there. Next, please. So before the next question, uh, can I request Sanjay to please, uh, uh, you know, sorry. So next question is, uh, sir, technologies like CRISPR are a slippery slope than can uh, very easily, that can very easily lead the way for eugenics. What are your thoughts on it? Yeah, yeah, this always comes up. So eugenics, uh, as people know, was uh, a German concept that was developed by the Nazis. Um, and obviously, at that time, they had no technology, knowledge and how to do this. And they used very crude technology uh, techniques to do that. Um, it is every piece of knowledge is a slippery slope. So every piece of knowledge is a slippery slope. So nuclear energy is a slippery slope. You can use it to produce electricity or you can make a bomb with it, right? Uh, CRISPR is the same way. We, we, we think about it, we use it to, uh, to cure people of diseases. Uh, but can you use it for things that are not so kosher? Yes, you know, that can certainly happen. And that's why uh, CRISPR utilization in, in, in germ lines, that means the inherited uh, um, uh, genes, uh, that there's been a consensus statement by scientists that have said, let's not use it on germ lines. But obviously in China, it was used on a germ line. So, um, you know, it's, it's uh, what we have to do is to regulate it properly and to use it for the benefit of, uh, of, of mankind and of all uh, living things on, on the planet rather than use it uh, in the way we've used uh, nuclear energy. But good question. The next question is, uh, as in college, when the teacher teaches us why there are times when everyone in the class puts questions and we don't have any questions in our mind, does it mean we have understood everything or we don't understand anything? How questions arise in the brain and can we deprogram the human brain? So let me try and answer this in this way. There was uh, one of the slides that I did not show you. There is this whole concept called um, uh, where um, we have, and let me see if I can maybe share that with you. you understand it better if I do that. Uh, just bear with me for a minute. Get you there. Yeah, the concept of readiness potential. So readiness potential is a, is a unique concept. Uh, it's a simple experiment that was done. And the experiment was that on your, on your scalp, we put a lot of brainwave recording equipment, and we ask you to, to tap the table in front of you three times in the next 10 minutes. So we don't know when you're going to tap the table. You don't know when you're going to tap the table, right? Um, and the, over the next 10 minutes, you will tap the table three times, right? Even before you know you are going to tap the table, we can tell you're going to tap the table because we get this readiness potential, right? So this was a simple study that was done. A uh, lot of, you know, a lot of electrodes to record your brain waves. Uh, you were to tap the table three times in the next 10 minutes. But before you knew you were going to tap the table, I can tell you're going to tap the table because I get a readiness potential. Right? This study was shut down. Because it was very disconcerting. Why was it disconcerting? It meant that then electrical activity had started in your brain at some place. And when it reaches a different place, you become aware that you are going to do this. And then you perform that action. If I can tell what you are going to do before you know you are going to do it, that is controversial at the nth level. Right. All our legal systems are based on the concept of free will. That means you chose to do it. 
this readiness potential is telling you you may not have chosen to do this an electrical activity has already started in your brain that you are unaware of once it reaches a certain point you take ownership and then you perform that action right so this is uh, this is something that has really caused us to think again um, and and really work on this concept uh, a little bit more so this it tells you a little bit about where things uh, volitional or evolutional things start in your brain and how do we start to do things and that's probably possibly where how questions other things may be arising that we are not fully aware of next yes sir so you had uh, you said for longer stimulation the memory gets stronger and lasts for long because of a new synapse being formed which is actually a gap between two brain cells is it because more neurons get developed at the site or something else as you explained there is a change that takes place so essentially from eric kendel's work what we know is that you have a genetic change in the in the neuron which leads to formation of the second brain cell right that's what happens so one uh, one synapse and then a second synapse is formed uh, and that forms long term memory and that second synapse happens because of genetic change now uh, more neurons uh, i don't know about that but there are adult stem cells present in the hippocampus of every human being so uh if you radiate the brain you actually kill those adult stem cells uh in the hippocampus so that's why people who had brain irradiation their memory and cognition becomes worse partly because of this partly because of damage to existing cells too uh but yes there are uh, adult stem cells in the hippocampus and that's where a lot of research is looking to see if we can generate new brain cells from that so next question is uh, which part of the brain is activated by bdnf and what is the role of bdnf in cognitive function second next question is in wernick korsakoff syndrome which part of the brain is affected okay so let me uh, tackle the bdnf first the brain derived neurotrophic factor so um it affects the brain as a whole we have not been able to specify which regions of the brain it is a good chemical for the brain uh, to have uh no specific therapeutics have been looked at they've been using it to regenerate parts of the brain which has not really worked as far as we know in modern uh, science uh there are some claims that certain yogic techniques may enhance bdnf uh, in some uh, initial studies uh, may have been done on that Uh, but we really don't understand very specifically how bdnf uh, really works um, you know in terms of the specific regions of the brain it does have a beneficial effect on various parts of the brain itself in wernicke's korsakoff you know it's a vitamin deficiency that causes this wernicke's korsakoff and it's the central regions of the brain that get affected by it uh, more than the outer regions of the brain Uh, and it happens a lot in 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 people with vitamin deficiency and also pp patients on alcohol especially alcoholics who get like a, a good dose of glucose uh, they pass out that can also set them into this wernicke's korsakoff um, so in this what happens is that people lose their memory they confabulate uh, and they also may develop you can just have wernicke's encephalopathy or you may have wernicke's korsakoff uh, as a whole syndrome but it's a vitamin related thing it affects the central part of the brain uh, and you can see changes on imaging all through the central parts of the brain next uh, the beta blockers do they create a permanent damage in the process of recalling memory in the case of ptsd patients memory yeah so let me just state that it will not used in clinical practice so this is all research uh, stuff uh beta blockers the only thing they do that we know of is slow the heart and decrease blood pressure you know that's a and we it's the one of the commonest drugs used in medicine today um it's fascinating that it, it can have this kind of an impact on memory and most of the studies i've shown you have been within the last few years uh and so uh we are still learning a lot about it so i'm not advocating anyone try this out but uh uh you know obviously once it gets approved through regular channels uh, for medical use one can use it uh but the effect of beta blockers is essentially to slow the heart and decrease your blood pressure that's all that we have yeah next uh next question is that um 
does that mean that we can use uh, beta blockers to overcome phobias and again the next question is on beta blockers i'll say that also uh, yes. are these beta blockers reversible in their regulation and action and also how these beta blockers are regulated in the brain so a i would not recommend that you take beta blockers uh, do so only under the advice of physicians uh, please don't take medications without that uh, because it can slow your heart and decrease your blood pressure so you know that's a that's a thing that i would not recommend um we still don't know uh, all the effects that it has on the memory apparatus and how it how it does that but you know people don't wait for how it does that if we can have a beneficial effect they use it so um you know i can't really talk about specifics but there are certain uh, security agencies that use this in their people you know so that they don't develop ptsd with that kind of uh, uh, situation um, but yes, it's not out for clinical use at this point in time. And all of the things that I talked about are very recent things. So they are still evolving. And if someone wants to pursue those kinds of research too in their fields, um, you know, that's why I like to share it with as broad an audience as possible, because then you can learn and you can do these things uh, and carry the research forward in, in, in a proper environment. Next. Uh, could adrenaline and propanol be practically used with people with different phobias or is it not recommended if not why so i would tell you that within the next few years it will be clinically utilized you know uh, with phobias because um you know the idea is you have a phobia say of an insect and i expose you to that insect so you recollect that memory and then i give you the propranolol that stops that from getting uh, reconsolidated and therefore the phobia goes away so uh, you know, I think it will be utilized. I would not recommend it right now. Once your doctors are ready under medical advice, you, should, you I would suspect the next few years you will start to use it. So related question, uh, does propanolol have adverse effects? Pro only adverse effect that the propanolol, which is a beta blocker, it has is it slows down your heart and it can drop your blood pressure. So that's why these treatments should only be used with medical supervision. Right. Why do doctors suggest not to take stress or overthink if someone is suffering from some life-threatening disease? Why do people lose weight when they are under mental stress? Does brain act as a parasite when we keep worrying? So again, let me uh share my slide and i'll tell you exactly why brain why they tell you to be happy um and stuff uh during this so let's see if i can do this in a proper manner okay so this is the new research that has just come out you know it's titled it has got a provocative title um so i wouldn't go with the title but being happy can cure cancer. So what they have found is that there is the reward system in your brain. So what is the reward system? This is the reward system. Uh, so you have this system within your brain, which is the reward system, and the neurochemical that's associated with it is dopamine, right? You also develop um, addictions because of the reward circuits too. But what they did in these uh, animals was they... Um, what they did was they planted uh, cancer into the animal, right? And what they then did was they stimulated uh, this reward pathway regularly, right? So the happiness pathway, um, contentment pathway, they uh, stimulated in these animals regularly. And what they found was that the tumor growth, right, uh, was uh, 40%, 40 to 50%, this tumor was 40 to 50% smaller in those who had the reward pathway stimulated, meaning happiness, as opposed to those who did not. And why did this happen? You have uh, what's called the pro-tumor, pro-cancer uh, uh, pathways and the anti-cancer pathways. And what this reward pathway stimulation did was that it slowed down the pro-tumor pathways, right? And therefore it led to a smaller tumor size or cancer size. So, uh, I, you know, so hopefully this explains to you why uh, we do this kind of, um, uh, kind of thing and what does this actually mean uh, in, in, in the long run. So I'm gonna try to stop sharing and then we'll be back. Thank you. Next, please. 
so there are cases where memory is a very vague or not there are uh, or not there at all related to a traumatic event how does that work so uh, that is where uh, we think retrieval becomes a cons- uh, a problem so the memory is certainly there in the brain it uh, the person is just choosing not to retrieve it uh not a lot of studies have been done because we can't find um, uh, you know these people very readily or the centers that are doing the research don't find these people readily and then they sort of uh, you know sort of recover from that so that's where there, there's a limitation it's the same limitation as we are studying consciousness and we are trying to study meditation and consciousness in the united states uh, we don't find uh, you know really master meditators and we have to have a real difference between the experimental and the control state for us to really find a difference and so um this has not been studied very diligently in biological neuroscience it has been studied well in in psychology but not in biological neuroscience next the next good comment about the ethical safeguards that need to be taken into account in memory modification studies so this is where um you know um neuroethics comes comes into play uh because the question is not just um uh, the main question is who should decide should society or governments decide should an individual decide obviously we are not there yet in terms of modulating memory in the way uh you know but we will be very soon and so these questions have to be debated by a larger audience than just your physicians and some neuroscientist and that that's the reason why i share this so that everyone can grapple with this question first of all i want people to understand that human existence as we know it today will change profoundly within the next decade or two uh, by advances in neuroscience in genetics in artificial intelligence uh, just these three things will change the way we exist on this planet uh and so uh but i find that the vast majority of people are unaware and that's why you know such conferences and meetings are so essential because people need to become aware of it because each one of us needs to think this through grapple with these questions and then collectively come up come uh to some conclusion next uh is there any ethical committee established yet for brain experiments and future exploitation in brain in humans <laughs> yeah there in the united states at least and also in india i'm sure there are irb institutional review boards that every uh, research trial has to go through and cannot be approved without that um, um but i, I can't com- most countries have an irb uh, institutional review board and they also have federal uh, institutional review boards and if they're devices they have to be approved by the fda um you know um so it, it's all being done in a very controlled and peer uh, reviewed sort of fashion um yeah next the next is what are the genetic risk factors for developing alzheimer's disease is there an inheritance pattern of this yes there are four ge- genetic abnormalities that we already know that can cause early alzheimer's uh, disease and so um those ge- genetic markers are certainly there and so that's where the question comes up so when a baby is born um you know or is being conceived those genes would be present so you can actually see if someone's getting a down syndrome baby or not and uh with crispr can you correct that and should you correct that and if you can who should have the say in that the parents or society or governments and so obviously as physicians we look at this only from a how to benefit patients perspective uh but there there can be others uh too uh, and so that's what um, i think societies and governments have to grapple with first of all have the ability to do this in the right way and then grapple with it on um, how to regulate it uh, in in those means next next is uh, traditional herbs like uh, shank pushpi do they really have an impact on our memory so i have said this at various forums and i'll say it again here um i think what we need to do uh you know i i always they practices um you know as they've been there um you know whether it's in the ashtang hridayam or or other uh, ayurvedic texts uh what we need to do is there's a wealth of knowledge there and what we need to do is to uh, is to study it in a scientific manner so that we can get to what is the principal uh, chemical that's actually causing the effect and is there an effect and how how do we use it because uh, a lot of that knowledge has been unfortunately lost over time 
but we can uh, regrow that uh, by studying it in, in, in a scientific manner with randomized control studies and at molecular cellular studies. And there needs to be a huge movement for that within India uh, because that's where the knowledge exists. And so in our country, we really need to take this ancient science and study it in a scientific fashion and then use it as it was supposed to be used for the benefit of all. The next question is, uh, how to stimulate memory to enhance learning? So uh, there are various things that naturally happen uh, on that. One thing that I could possibly tell you is that your memory, your, your verbal memory and your visual memory stay in different parts of your brain. So your verbal memory stays in your dominant hippocampus and your visual memory stays in your non-dominant hippocampus. So when young students are studying, I often get this and I tell them it's what your teachers have asked you to do. When you're studying something, write it down and also say it out aloud. So if you read and write, it goes to your left and your right hippocampus. And so the chances of you remembering that would be better. Uh, but that's the only tip I can give you. I'm sure your professors can give you a lot more. The next question is, elderly start recalling very old events, but do not recall recent, recent ones. Why? So good question. So, you know, what happens is that in Alzheimer's uh, dementia, which affects a large number of the elderly, uh, the hippocampus is what undergoes the damage, right? Ma major damage initially is in the hippocampus. And so, as I told you uh, in my talk, hippocampus has your memories from the from a few minutes to about 10 years or so, right? Uh, and so these people, because of hippocampal damage, don't remember what they did two days ago or two years ago. But they will remember, uh, you know, their high school because that memory is no longer in the hippocampus. That has gone to the association cortices in other parts. Not being damaged yet. So that is where these things, uh, that's why they do not remember last few minutes to last few years, uh, but they remember something that happened in their childhood. The next is, next. Uh, why do we sometimes fake fall in our sleep? And what is this called? Fall. Okay. I mean, you shouldn't be falling unless you sort of got off the bed, but there is the concept of sleepwalking, you know, that is certainly there. And we don't very understand that very, very well yet, you know, about why the sleepwalking phenomenon happens. Uh, we do understand that there is a disorder called REM behavior disorder, which is uh, when you are dreaming, uh, when you're in the REM phase or dream phase of your sleep, what happens there is that every muscle in your body is paralyzed. Almost every muscle in your body is paralyzed. Why is it paralyzed? It is paralyzed because if it was not paralyzed, you would act out your dreams. So you would hit the person sleeping next to you. And when that does not happen, when you're not paralyzed during your dream phases, uh, then we call it REM behavior disorder. So these are individuals that, you know, have violent kicking and, and other motions that happen. The fascinating part is that each one of you had four dreams last night, four vivid dreams last night. And I would bet that you don't remember more than one of those. Um, and so the dream phenomenon itself, which we are looking into because of our interest in consciousness, is a very fascinating concept. Uh, but yes, other sleep phenomena like sleepwalking and stuff have not been studied with that degree of detail yet, which they need to be. Next. So what are the latest models that explain the physiology of human cognition at the neuron level with comparison with artificial neural network model used in machine learning? So, you know, they, they've tried, you know, the word artificial intelligence is kind of interesting because it's essentially machine learning. Uh, it's data driven uh, processes. So, you know, like in medicine, uh, what we are doing is we are having them look at 100 million MRIs of the brain, right? And then they get so good, we got pattern recognition that they can make out normal versus abnormal, right? That's essentially what it is. It's really not intelligence at a human level. And intelligence at a human level is, intelligence is the one concept that we have not been able to really study in great measure in human beings. I mean, we have IQs and stuff, but at a cellular level, what is intelligence in a neuron? 
or in a group of neurons. We have not really been able to do that. We can increase your mathematical abilities and art abilities, um, uh, you know, by by the things that I talked about. But is that intelligence? Or what actually is intelligence? You know, that's where uh, other sciences need to collaborate with neuroscience to uh, to really do this uh, in a much more proper manner. Next. Uh, given the differences in cultures, do you feel neuroscience also requires cross-cultural studies as seen in, as seen in psychology and other similar disciplines? It's, you know, it's neuroscience is a very biological thing. So it's, it's this, you know, two plus two is equal to four, can't be five, that kind of stuff. But yes, there are aspects of neuroscience that can certainly benefit. And I certainly feel that the cross-cultural aspect um, needs to be looked at. You know, remember the, the epigenetics concept of the mice that ate green leafy vegetables gave rise to uh, um, healthy babies in the agouti mice? Uh, that I talked about over over centuries, every culture had developed a certain kind of diet that they wanted pregnant women to take. Right? Uh, it was true in in our country of India. Um, now, then came us, the doctors, right? Uh, people who were very sure of ourselves, and we said, "Oh, that is all nonsense. That doesn't mean a thing. Uh, just listen to us and eat healthy food." Right? Well, over centuries, they had figured they didn't know epigenetics. But over centuries, they had figured out that when pregnant women ate a certain kind of food, they had a better outcome, right? Uh, but we, in our, uh, you know, um, half-baked science, we did away with all that. So that kind of, uh, of historical cultural knowledge is important and is worth studying, which we are not. The other is uh, the, the study that was recently done with uh, Sanskrit, in chanting in Sanskrit. And hippocampal volumes have changed and have become bigger. And so, uh, you know, those who have regularly done Sanskrit chanting. So it's important to study that to see what exactly does this, um, you know, uh, causes this. So that kind of, uh, you know, understanding cultures and actually utilizing it, um, you know, like the Aboriginal, uh, Aboriginal cultures from uh, Australia, uh, you know, the sounds and the music they make, that has a very profound effect on the brain. So uh, it's important to sort of do studies on those concepts uh, that I think is really important. Next, please. So next is why do we remember some dreams but not others? So the dreams that you remember is when you get up during REM sleep. So, you know, when you are in REM sleep and something happens in your environment and you get up, you remember that sleep. Or if the dream is so disturbing that it wakes you up, you remember those dreams. But other dreams you do not remember. You know, and there's some people who say, I don't dream, they all dream. We've put people you know, under our uh, equipment and studied them, every single person dreams. Yeah. Uh, so if we've understood how to retrieve memories and store them in digital forms, can we do brain mapping of model organisms to understand and cure incurable diseases? So that is the idea, but we are at, in the, you know, we, we have started on that journey, but we have just started. So this prosthetic uh, has not yet even achieved an FDA approval because it's just being started. So what happens here in the U.S. is uh, neuroscientists, neurologists, uh, even neurosurgeons, I would include them. Uh, you know, as we work on it, we work on it in a university lab. We find something, but then a company has to be formed to take it into a commercial uh, venture and do it at a mass scale. So uh, we are, you know, we have just started that journey. It's a fascinating journey. It is really fortunate that we have started that journey, but we have just started. So there's a long way to go. And the purpose is to, to treat things like dementia, where, you know, people could, uh, you know, so treat things like dementia, where you... Next. Right, so next question is, uh, while this question is on, uh, while this, uh, while discussing about consciousness, you talked about coma patients and when they were asked to imagine their brain regions, uh, uh, when they were asked to imagine their brain regions were activated similar to normal people. Were these patients responding to audio stimulus and visualize? So what was happening, they were in a function of MRI machine. Okay. And uh, they were... <laughs> So if you could, if everyone could mute their phones or equipment, that would help out. Okay. 
So thank you. So uh, what was happening was that they were in an MRI machine uh, and a functional MRI was being done. And they were told, they were told by verbal cue that please imagine as if you're playing tennis. And then the next cue was, please imagine as if you're walking around in your house. And then when they did this, and when they were able to answer questions correctly, it became evident to us, or has become evident to us, that these are people that are not really unconscious. Uh, they are just not able to respond verbally or move their arms and legs. And that's why we are thinking that these are in vegetative states. Now, remember, those who've had extensive brain damage, they are in vegetative state and coma. They usually don't do this. These are a few individuals. In this study, it was four out of 28 that were able to do this. But even four out of 28 is fascinating. Should we take these people who say are in deep coma and try this to really determine whether they are conscious or not. Those are things that are that we are grappling with at this point in time. Uh, and then obviously the technology of deep brain stimulation of whether we can put that in the intralaminar nucleus of the thalamus and see if we can wake these people up. So again, all of this is, in, is, is really high end recent research. It hasn't uh, gone into clinical practice yet. Next. Yes, sir. So, yes. so you talked about how by taking a chemical, one could get rid of insect. But what if somebody tried to conquer this fear just by cognitive thinking? The molecular chemistry would be similar to that of which happened while taking a chemical. Hmm. Very excellent thought. You know, that study has not been done and probably should be tried, you know. Um, that can certainly be thought of. It's an easy, easy thing to do um, and can be tried. I, you know, I think it has promise. Absolutely. Next. So another question from the same person uh, is that uh, what is really happening when synapse gets stronger? Does the axon and dendritic ending come closer? So it's a it's a neurochemical phenomenon. It's not so much a physical phenomenon uh, when the uh, synapse, when we say it gets stronger. So what happens is the cyclic AMP pathway really is the key here. Um, and uh, that if you look at Eric Kendall's work, you know, it'll explain it much greater detail. Um, you know, I just didn't feel the need to go into this in a, in a diverse audience uh, and bore you with all the, the neurochemical, biochemical details, but it's it's very well studied. So it's a neurochemical uh, strengthening, it's not really a physical strengthening, as opposed to a new synapse, which is a physical and a neurochemical phenomenon. So next question is, uh, how does neurology and neuropsychology intersect? So the founder of neuropsychology is Brenda Milner, the lady that I talked about from Montreal. Um, you know, she developed neuropsychology. So in our neurological institute, you know, we have uh, neuropsychologists who work with us. And how do they work with us? So they do neuropsychological testing of patients to determine which part of the brain may be damaged. We match that with our uh, findings like on MRIs and PET scans and SPECT scans and all of that and our clinical exam. And that helps us localize where the problem may be. They also help us, the neuropsychologist, in doing a test called the VARA test. I don't know if you guys have heard about it. We do it regularly. So we... When we are trying to cure people of epilepsy, one of the things we do is we, we do epilepsy surgery. So we cut out the hippocampus. But before we cut out one of your hippocampus, uh, we want to make sure that you have enough memory on the other side. So what do we do? We actually uh, put a catheter in the blood vessel that supplies blood to your brain, the carotid artery, and we inject sodium amytal, which deadens or knocks out half your brain for 10 minutes. So we can test the other half of your brain for 10 minutes. Then we knock out this half of the brain for 10 minutes and test the other half for memory and language. So um, uh, the neuropsychologists help us in doing that test. And it's a fascinating test because, um, you know, it's not often that you get to shut down half the person's brain um, and then make it actually comes back in about 10 minutes or so. Uh, and so we uh, we do that. We have a long list of medical students who always want to come and attend those tests. Uh, because they're so fascinating. But yeah, neuropsychologists help us a lot. They're a very essential part of any neurological institute. The next question is, uh, restless limb syndrome is associated with which phase of sleep and how? So the restless leg syndrome is usually in the non-REM phase of sleep. Um, and it is, uh, again, treated by uh, medications, which alter the neurochemicals in the brain. 
the interesting phenomenon is one of the treatments for restless leg syndrome is a drug that actually increases your potential for gambling. So, so when you're playing, uh, when you're uh, playing with neurochemicals in the brain, you have to be aware that it can have all kinds of impact. Uh, you know, which is fascinating. Right. So, next question is: If ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, does that mean our brain has a memory of every evolutionary stage we've gone through, and on some subconscious level knows how to trigger that stage? Can we retrieve those information and change how we essentially look or function, like maybe change ourselves to create wings or so? So, uh, you know, this is a very controversial subject because what happens is that these things are not just confined to the brain, you know. Um, once you enter the realms of philosophy and religion and stuff like that, these things can become very, very uh, controversial very, very quickly. So, uh, you know, uh, phylogeny and ontogeny are fine. I think, uh, you know, obviously your genes and, um, um, and that does. And in evolution, we do have uh, a genetic basis for it. So uh, what, you, what you get is essentially, uh, so one of the things that we do have um, in our concept is that you know when you have microcephaly so some uh, babies are born with a small head uh, and they are developmentally delayed and stuff uh, and so um, uh, chris walsh at harvard has done this study where he has gone in and looked at that what happens is that when a gene mutates so a gene has mutated to take us from say uh, a chimpanzee to a human being or a monkey to a human being right but that gene remains unstable for millions of years and so if that gene flips back, you know, you get a smaller head. So that's, so that's that type of phylogenetic phylogeny has been done. But if you look at memory uh, of, of, of that and how does that work, it, it's kind of difficult because, you know, um, you know, obviously in our ancient text, if you go and look at that, you know, you have uh, different explanation for it. So you have uh, uh, what's called buddhi, ahankara, manas, and chitta. So that is very different from uh, um, uh, what we are looking at in, in science. And that's the part of the cultural, uh, you know, knowledge that we have to sort of incorporate at some point to learn things a little bit more. But uh, I hope that answers uh, the question as best as I could. Yes. Our next question is, uh, uh, just one second, sir. The, the next question is, how to keep our brains healthy and fit? So this is what you know, people are making a big business out of, uh, you know, do these um, exercise and I mean, do this um, type of men mental exercise and you'll get better. The evidence that we have today, and I was recently interviewed by a television channel here in America, and I'm sure the companies never liked it. But um, the thing that we have evidence for is if you play crossword, if you do crossword puzzle, you get good at crossword puzzle. Right? That doesn't mean you'll get good at math. We have no evidence of that in, in, in neurology. So uh, essentially what I tell people for brain health is yes, intellectual pursuits will help. You know, um, What will also help is if you eat right, You know, just like for your heart health, uh, You know, if you eat well, your brain will be healthy too. Uh, exercise, we do know that helps uh, definitely because it releases neurochemicals um, you know, that are healthy for the brain. So those are the three things that we can talk about in an evidence-based fashion. The rest, uh, I can't really comment on at this point. So there's another question. Can we use neurotoxins for treatment of degenerative diseases? For example, botulinum? So what we use botulism Botox for is currently for migraine headaches because it can paralyze the muscles. You know, So the bo Botox essentially does is paralyzes muscles. Um, there's not much information in neurodegenerative disorders, and migraine, fortunately, is not a neurodegenerative disorder. So uh, for migraine, it is certainly a, a, a treatment, um, uh, but not for others, yeah. Okay, so there's another question. Um, could you please tell, I have come... Uh, I have come across a research which says that there were five criminals and the court announced punishment that they were bitten by cobra, there were doctors, performing the research the criminals were handed over to doctors 
when the day came doctors covered their eyes and doctor pinched them with pin and the results were shocked that uh, and the results were shocking that out of 5 3 were found dead and neuroscientists found the cobra poison in dead bodies hmm. yeah i mean i'm not an expert on um, cobra poisons I and mean, that would be something that i'd have to read and learn about i i must admit i'm not aware of that and i can't explain it from my knowledge but i would certainly uh, try and find more information about it okay sir uh, one last question uh, sure. so can you tell us more on the diagnosis progression and treatment of schizophrenia so yeah i mean schizophrenia you know obviously is a psychiatric illness not a neurological illness um and that is just because we've separated out the field of psychiatry which deals with the mind and the field of neurology which deals with the brain which is artificial schizophrenia uh, essentially let me tell you a couple of things that scientists have found uh scientists other than myself so please don't describe this to me uh the credit goes to them uh schizophrenia is when people have hallucinations and delusions um and so the concept is that there is a part of your brain that is telling you that you know like when you daydream right you may daydream and think that you are uh, a great sports person right um but somewhere in your brain there's a center that tells you this is you daydreaming this is not reality and it's schizophrenic that center seems to be malfunctioning now that center has not been found yet uh the other thing also that is fascinating is that uh humans normal human beings you cannot tickle yourself you know you cannot tickle yourself others can tickle you but you cannot tickle yourself in schizophrenics uh, we find that they can tickle themselves so is this um concept also from that same part of the center that's that that's not able to distinguish in real and that schizophrenia is also found in um, in renal abnormalities which is a which is a gene protein found in development of the brain so there are various parts of this that we are that we have some knowledge of we haven't really found uh the basis yet and i always uh, liken it to you know a blind man looking at the elephant someone has the tail someone has the leg and someone has the trunk and we are all trying to um get a full explanation with this i think what we need to do is you need to have the molecular and cellular um and the geneticist and the and the neuroscientists all sit together and really come up with a better explanation of what schizophrenia is um i think one of the things that is going to help is uh, um a concept which we call uh, brain organoids uh, and so now uh, they are growing a brain in a petri dish right uh, and so uh, young female scientist uh, from europe has really worked hard on this and so now they can grow a brain as if it was a 6 to 10 week old brain uh and they can grow it in a petri dish uh with the knowledge that we now have and then you can test uh, or or you can understand brain diseases better with that brain organoid a, a brain in a petri dish than you can in other fields but i think in schizophrenia all of these fields need to come together to really determine um uh, you know a more comprehensive view of what the disorder is and so what the treatment would be Thank you, sir, for uh, patiently answering all the questions. Uh, next, I will uh, give the mic to um, Jaswinda, Dr. Jaswinda. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sukhita. Uh, according to Saint Ambrose, who lived uh, many years ago, no duty is more urgent than that of the patient. I Dr Jaswinder Kaur take this humble opportunity as the convener of the conference to propose a heartfelt vote of gratitude uh the wonderful brain as we saw it nailed it completely and the preview to the conference could not have been better than this no we are actually we have seen such a whole hearted and delivered by a speaker so on behalf of gargi college and the entire teaching fraternity i would like to extend a very hearty gratitude to Dr Sanjay Pratap Singh who spared his very precious time to grace the occasion and share his knowledge with us today thank you sir for your very thought provoking and interesting talk you held our attention like the expert speaker you are your talk was refreshing and we as an audience could very well relate to your examples and analysis 
I especially appreciate that you, with all the humility, accommodated such huge number of queries. Uh, I would also like to thank our beloved principal, Dr. Pramila Kumar, and the chairman, Professor Ihan Khan Suri, for their guidance and moral support. Finally, I thank the wonderful and enthusiastic audience, not only from our department, but also from other departments of the institution and from across the country. Thank you for choosing to be with us. And because you clearly love learning, we would love to host you all again on 16th and 17th October at New Year 2020. We hope you all had a nice evening. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much.